Okay, we're being recorded and webinar has started. Okay. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and renewed by Governor Maura Healy, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted by via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instruction on the Board of Health posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings as soon as technologically possible. After this meeting, all of board approved all approved Board of Health minutes are posted on our website once they are approved by the board. I will now open this February 8th Board of Health meeting at 534 with a roll call. Um, Risha? Here. Premila? Here. Lauren? Here. Tim? Here. Okay, we're all here. Um, so the next, the first item on our agenda is to review the minutes of the previous meeting. Did anyone have any comments on them? No. I did. Um, in the in the top, it said that I had um, requested that. Uh, a word be changed. And yeah, I, I think I think that was me. I thought I yeah. noticed because it says M Mills, which is not either of us really. But so we'll need to fix that it and change the last name there. Um, I did yeah. have a little bit of um, a, a couple of things about the tobacco meeting. I know that was confusing enough, but I think the way it's written in the minutes is not exactly what we talked about. And I actually went back and listened because I was hoping we were a little more clear than that. And we were. Um, so a, a small thing in the second line of the Tibet old business part A, con coordinator for the Pioneer Valley Tobacco, it's just coalition. The word control doesn't go in there. Um, not a big deal. But the, the second um, the following sentence that begins at the meeting, um, it's about a third and a, or a half of the way down, it, that they learned that the state had model template for tobacco regulations. That's not exactly the case. And, and so I did write a different sentence for that. At the meeting, they discussed the differences between the state model template that many municipalities use and the Amherst regulations, which differ in format. When asked if this difference posed any issues for the Tobacco Coalition inspectors, Meredith O'Leary replied she had developed a separate checklist for Amherst, but it was not a problem. And then I, I don't know why this I changed, but M. Malay stated that the first step in working on the tobacco regulation is to decide whether to continue using the current Amherst format for the regulation or to use the model template develop, developed by the MHOA and the MAHB. Does anybody have any questions about that? No. Okay, so I'll forward this to uh, Kyle and, and Kiko, and we can just edit that. And then the last thing I noted was on the second page, new business playground surfacing in the second paragraph, it just says M. Wood, the project manager. manager. And it's her title is really the owner's project manager. And that makes a difference because she actually works for the town She's hired by the town from a company different from the designers and developers of the project to kind of represent the town's interest and to keep things moving along. So I thought that we should add owners there. Um, so I know with the 
can we get a motion to accept the minutes with those changes? I'll propose that we accept the minutes with those changes. I can second. Okay. Um, can, we can vote then. Um, I'm just going by the order of my screen, which keeps changing. Lauren? Yes. Pramila? Uh, yes. Risha? Yes. Tim? I was not... I was not oh, there. Oh, yeah, I forgot, Tim. You weren't there. Maureen, yeah, yes. So the minutes are accepted. Okay. All right. And this goes away. Um, and now I guess we have the time for public comment. This is time is open for public comment for um, topics that are on the agenda and the time per person is limited to three minutes per person. I Do have technical, um, is someone keeping time, a track of the time? Uh, no, I guess we could. I can do that. Um, okay. Five minutes. I said three. Three, got it, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'm promoting Tony to panelists, it's just who popped up first. All right, Tony, you have about three minutes and you can go ahead and speak. Hi, thank you. I'm calling today about the playground surfacing decision uh, mm -hmm. for the new elementary school. And I've been following the elementary school project since the beginning and have also learned in the last couple of years about the presence of toxic chemicals in rubber poured in place unitary surfacing and also in artificial turf. But that was a separate project you talked about before. So tonight, I just wanted to advocate for a, a surfacing I for the new so. school playground that does not contain toxic chemicals um, such as lead and potentially PFAS. Um, my preference would be for the engineered wood fiber per the Tory report, the Lowell Sustainable Center re recommendation. But I understand there's a preference for a unitary surface. And in that case, this new product, well, new to the US, Corkeen seems like a really good alternative. So I'm just calling today to advocate for that. And thank you for looking into this. Thank, thank you. you Tony. I'm going to make them a attendee. And then we have one more raised hand, Maria. I'm going to promote them to panelist. Okay, Maria, you have three minutes. Hi there. Thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. Forgive my hat, it's cold in my house. Um, so uh, also commenting on the, the rubber report in place, I understand that you've received um, my follow-up email to you. Um, and yes, for uh, I really encourage the Board of Health to take a stand and advise against the inclusion of rubber report in place, um, particularly at this site, as the Conservation Con uh, Commission has already indicated their concern about uh, 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 problems uh, to the environment because this is adjacent to the um, to the Fort River and there's drainage into there. Um, for all the reasons that uh, that that Tony stated, there's lots of chemicals. Um, six uh, PPD quinone was another one that uh, that has recently come up, and I understand that um, uh, uh, um, uh, you you you've gotten that, so I'm not going to go into all the other things. But phthalates, VOCs, all these things. Um, Corkeen does uh, uh, provide an excellent alternative, and I would hope that you would ask them to, uh, the, the building committee, to really uh, consider using that. It has all of the protections against uh, falls, and, um, and it has all the accessibility, wheelchairs can roll, and it's a unitary surface. I had the opportunity since your last meeting to make calls to a bunch of uh, places throughout the US and there are a number of companies that are installing cork port in place now the corkine um so that's a good thing and they uh, the people that I talked to are like we get many many calls every week um about this i also uh, was able to track down some testing that uh in in a playground uh on the east coast where uh they wanted a 7 foot 
fall critical fall height for for the a piece of equipment and they did the testing on it and they just they they just like with rubber poured in place they pour a thicker surface the the higher the fall height and they did gmax testing and all these other the critical fall testing for the head injuries and everything and it tested fine so it has all the benefits um but not the downsides um of the the chemicals that are in rubber so again i i encourage you to to uh, advise that for the health and safety of the users um, and the environment. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, if is that all the comments as far as you know, Kyle? Yeah, no other hands are raised. Okay. Um, so we'll move to old business and we will start with tobacco regulations, um, tobacco sales regulations to be specific. Um, and I hope this, we were able to, people were able to uh, get a better handle on the change that we were talking about last at the last meeting where we were going to start by just comparing the Amherst uh, tobacco sales regulation with the model or sample format from the MAHB or from 2023. The, the most recent one we have access to is 2023. We will probably be working on the 20 with the 2024 one, which will be out any any day. Did I guess my question is, do people understand the question and have thoughts about the different uh, formats of the of the regulations? We are really not right now talking about the actual regulations, just about how they read and how they are put together. Are there any questions about about that? I'm sorry. I am. Um, I am trying to just clarify. We're just asking about the format again, and not the questions that were on one of the documents, like um, what we want to answer and the pros and cons. And there was like six or five questions. You just yeah. We're, we're not. That. We're not going to be okay. voting on those today. But we might go over them. We would like to go over them and just kind of. Um, explain them a little bit um so we know you know we can be prepared to to look at them more closely in the next in the next month um we sh once we make this decision the people from the m8 one of those organizations <laughs> will be actually putting it together for us and then we'll have a document to look at and then consider the those um areas where we need to make a decision on, on what we want in the regulation. But if we were first wanted to get through this step, so then they can put it together the way we want it to be put together. Any other questions about this or just comments? I will say that the checklist format at the beginning um, seemed user friendly. Um, that's you know that that's just for us to help write the write the regulation. That first checklist about the yeses and the noes is that what you're referring to? that doesn't end up in the regulation. That's just a helpful um, summary of, of the things to consider. You're muted, Pramila.
I don't think I have any questions, um, but I have thought about which one I prefer. Um, Let's talk about that. <laughs> and and I don't have any strong feelings, but because I don't have any strong feelings, I think I would I would put a vote in for keeping it the Amherst way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand the benefits of it are are really um, about how the logic is and the drawbacks, you know, are not a problem right now because they have already accommodated mm -hmm. us. And there there are a few other, maybe this wasn't clear, that there are a few other uh, areas, uh, parts of the state that are also different. It's not just Amherst that's different. Right. Or... I... I, I agree. I think the way it, the one of the things I think is maybe that the I don't know how often the permit holders look at these regulations, but they're kind of used to the format by now. And I think the part that separates out, OK, the adult only ones, everybody has to do all of these things. The adult only ones, in addition to that, need to do these four things. And the non-age restricted has one other regulation, I think, that they need to follow. Um, I think the benefits of changing to the sample that the state, that the MAHB um, provides is it's easier when you re when you are um, updating them because just finding the parts, it, it, uh, it, it doesn't follow in the same way. So it's just a little trickier on the side of updating. I don't know if other people have any feel what they what they think they the benefits would be or or on either side of this so the at uh, the so I, I was not there in the last meeting so but anyway I'm uh, just for clarification questions, the the model one um, from the Mass Board of Health, we are considering some sort of a comparing whether we need to adopt that or not. Is that right? It, it's just about the template. So our outline is different than theirs. Right. That's 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 the difference. It's not about the content at all. And um, we have a different one. We either keep it or or go back to the, the state one, and then we can make the changes and have all the interesting discussions. <laughs> the only advantage of the state one is probably it's vetted through some legal uh, scholars, right? Uh, no? No, it, it's just yeah. how it's organized. It's actually, the statements are almost, are literally identical, identical. but it's, they're just in put in different places. It's just an organizational uh change a format change and it, it the 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 words uh, in the regulations are really the same as the as the uh mahb ones um and like i said it's just tricky as you if you're trying to compare them because they're like all over the place but you can find the same words is if if you look it's it's just a little little trickier for that um and I guess the section one and two on ours is simpler than the MAHB, it, where they have all those whereas statements. We just have information about why these in, why these uh, regulations are important, and it reads more easily. Yeah. So, um, but that's not that's not really a regulation. That's just a preamble. Yeah, I, I did actually have a question for the board about that. First of all, apologies. I had some major technical difficulties. I finally figured out what the problem was. But um, so here I am. It's nice to see everybody. Um, I did notice the difference because that whereas language I find not accessible. It's very sort of formal. And so I, it's interesting that that language is there and the language in our current regulations is simpler. Um, I think the meat of the regulations is what we're really after, yeah. not the statement of purpose so much. But I did notice that the title of our regulations is, um, I had all the documents up on my screen, but I had to restart my computer. So now I can't see it. It's not in front of me. But it says specifically regulations to limit 
um, access to tobacco products for minors, whereas the document, the template that the state has used is much more generic. And in fact, the regulations aren't just about minor sales okay. to minor, they're much broader than that. So it just kind of struck me that our title doesn't really reflect what the regulations are. So I wanted okay. to- Okay, well, there's, to the a, board. there's something to fix. Right. <laughs> um, again, that's a content issue, but- uh... So that's something to point out. Yeah. Um, Lauren, are you able to hear us? And we yes, hear you? I had to join my phone, but I'm like, okay, okay. Do you have any thoughts about this, or sorry, I was gonna say quickly. And I think there's an echo. So well, we're getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, I think I'm pretty much okay with whatever other people have said. I just um, think that the content of like whether we're making it more user friendly or things like that might depend on the format, but I think. Either way, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. OK. I think our format, um, we spent a lot of time in terms of wording and statements and everything, and it's, it reads well. Mm -hmm. So if we are comfortable with that, I, the only thing I would recommend is there was one case which was brought in about transfer of ownership, you know, mm -hmm. there was some some ambiguity about you know um, what type of establishment will can we we transfer it, and I think that's the only thing you know maybe we can clarify if we want to do any amendment here. So, in fact, that actually was pretty clear, and I don't know why that got so far as to come to us because mm -hmm. It was an it was a place that sold alcohol that was claiming because they are for over twenty one people who can buy alcohol that they're an age restricted, um, they could qualify as an age restricted tobacco retailer, but that definition actually says it cannot sell alcohol. So, mm -hmm. it, it I think it's it was pretty clear, but we we. We can ask about that. I, I I think I did ask Cheryl Sabara about that. And she said, oh, yeah, that was really clear. She came to our meeting that time and said, oh, this is clear. You can't do that. So, but I I agree. That was one of my thoughts that came up. But when I looked at the language again, it was pretty clear. But, but there are areas which do need to be clearer. There were other towns that have had problems, but we'll get to the substance of that in a little bit. Um, Can I make a motion that we just keep our format and we move forward and have the interesting discussions? <laughs> yes. Uh, is there a second to the motion? I can second it. And should we vote? Um, now it's uh, Premila? Yes. Risha? Yes. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Can't hear you. Yes. Okay. And Maureen, aye. Okay. Yes. Good. I'm glad we got that done. Now, Risha, I wondered if you would want to just go through a few of those, some of those questions and as to what the issues are, just to introduce them, and then we'll have a fuller discussion about it in the next meeting, or um or it um or is the written document enough for that i think that's it, it's an excellent explanation of some of these issues yeah um i'm also my computer doesn't like me right now um i'm happy to to talk through it um I think the, I don't want to read it to you. I, I, that's not a great use of our time together. Oh. Uh, 
but I can certainly sort of just the, the background is these are the questions that are substantial and content and don't have a clear right answer. There's a bunch of things we just have to do because we need to be aligned with the state regulations that have been updated since our last version. But these are the ones that we don't have to do. They are optional up to us. Um, and so I tried to articulate them. You'll see that there's obviously a seventh that I've said that's a different conversation for a later time and we're sort of punting that one. But the six feel like they can be um, decided upon how we want to, to move forward with those. Um, and I would say that the, the only reason not to vote on it or, or make decisions today would be if there's time restrictions um, or obviously if there's if people aren't ready to, and we want to look deeper into any of the issues and, and have people come and talk. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason that I can think of that we couldn't, if something is straightforward, that we couldn't make a decision today. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to offer that I did hear from Sarah McColgan today, who we had spoken with, um, you know, some time ago, and just checking in with us and offering her help. So I agree, Risha, it would be great to start maybe making some decisions that are easy and if they're and to and start compiling a list of questions that we can pose to an expert, which we can uh, who we can invite to the subsequent meeting to answer mm -hmm. some of those questions. So as much as we can get done today or you all can get done today, I that sounds great. Support that. Mm -hmm. So the, I can just sort of say the six questions and then I'll assume that people have had a chance to read and, and ask any questions that they want. I should say I'm not an expert on any of this. My goal is just <laughs> to lay out the decisions in front of us with uh, trying to understand the pros and cons of each one. So we've got a question about the tobacco quiz. This is a specific thing that Amherst has. Um, and do we want to keep it? Do we want to try some of the other things that other municipalities have tried, or do we want to get rid of it altogether? Um, should or or do our town inspectors go to non-tobacco outlets to check for regulated products? This is probably mostly dispensaries, but it could be other kinds of, of similar areas. Um, do we want to change our violation policy of automatic permit suspension on the first offense. Um, as I've said here, that is a harsher penalty than the state has, which is in, in um, and so do we want to align with them or keep that? Whether we want to keep prohib prohibited sale of rolling papers to minors, again, something not in the state that's only in ours. Do we want, to, want restrictions on non-tobacco, non-nicotine flavored wrap? all wraps or no restrictions on either? And do we want to increase our cigar pricing minimums? Uh, again, to match with what the state's models have now. Um, so those are the, the sort of six questions in front of us. I don't know if anybody has one that they're interested in or has questions on or wants to start talking about. We start with number one, you know, that the, the idea is that there's a way of educating what they call tobacco handlers, people who work in 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 um, stores that sell tobacco so that they can follow the rules. It's really the uh, permit holder's responsibility to make sure that the employees of the um, shop will follow all the rules. But... I think the education is 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 um, is a kind thing that towns do to try to help them follow the rules. We don't want to just catch them doing the wrong thing. We really want them to know what they're supposed to do and to do it. Um, oh, the past few years, the the idea was that there's this written quiz the the that's kind of educational, basically. If you read through it, and answer the questions, it makes you think about it, and then you uh, you, you, you you learn something in the process. It's not clear exactly how well those that um, has been followed. There's a lot of turnover in these positions in, in some of the convenience stores. 
Um, there's some other ways of, to approach that. And one of them is, um, is it's more formal way, which is a, it's a paid online, it's a online training that's paid for by the retailer and gives us, passes a certification for that employee. Um, it does cost money. It is a, a certification that the employee can take with them uh, if they move to other jobs. And the other one is that one of the uh, MAHB tobacco control persons, I think Sarah McColgan, um, can go and train. It's a train the trainer model where she would train the to permit holder and the store's manager, and then they would be responsible for training the other employees involved. Um, there's no data that any one process is better than any other in getting compliance and the trap uh, up to these regulations. So I don't know if people have thoughts about what seems to make sense. I sorry. Sorry, is that Lauren? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know my my um mute button was off. <laughs> I had it sorry. Um but you can go ahead, Risha, and I'll, I'll go after. I mean, I was just gonna say I um I don't know that keeping what we have makes the most sense. And I say that because it puts owners it, it puts work on us to keep it updated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and again, there's no evidence one way or the other that this is actually, um, helping people learn anything per se, um, we can assume so, but, um, yeah, my, I'm, I'm not sure I want to have to keep <laughs> remembering to update it and, uh, check if the rules change that impact any of these questions and, um, and so the other two seem lower effort, um, with maybe potentially better results, uh, you know, to, to go through a full training mm -hmm. or do nothing, which is just saying it's your job to adhere, do what you need to do to do that, which presumably means learning the rules. <laughs> um, I, I'm just trying to add to the conversation. I don't really have a strong preference, but um, I did look at the quiz questions and there were some that I wasn't sure the answers to. So it might prompt someone to gather more information or learn more. And I think you have to take it in person. Um, so it kind of, create some kind of, you know, relation with the town and the person who's going to have the letter who's taking the quiz. So I I think those would be pluses. Um, but I don't know. If, I mean, I always say maybe there's perhaps a way to do a combination of things, but I thought that the quiz was a good I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of your sentence. Your quiz was what? Oh, I, I think it is something that could be beneficial to keep. Okay. Thank you. Is it true that it has to be taken in person? Well, it's taken at the, I think it's administered by the, um, the manager that makes sure the the um, employee takes it at, when they start to work. And then it should be checked by the uh, tobacco coalition inspectors when they when they come through each year. But it's not necessarily taken at the town. It, it, it's no. that sort of handed to the person, presumably. Yeah. As firing onboarding. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much quality checking happens with this. So as far as I understand it, there's, you know, you hire a new person, they're supposed to take the quiz, the paper copy is supposed to, so it's a paper copy, so it's not online. So they're there in front of you, you're the manager, the person's filling it out, and then you put it in their file. But I don't think the tobacco compliance officers check those files to mm. see, because it's an Amherst thing. And currently, we're not inspecting to my knowledge, we don't have tobacco inspectors going out to look at these files and make sure that every employee who's currently working there has filled out one of these quizzes. So I think it just begs the question of, sounds good, but if it's not actually being followed up on to ensure that staff people really do have the information that they need to not do something like sell to a minor, then why make people do it? Like either improve the process or don't do it at all, it seems like is the question because it doesn't make sense to do something that's not really measurable. Mm. Does that make sense to you, Risha? I mean, since you sort of got this in more depth than, that's my understanding anyway. Yeah, and you know, as you're speaking, it, it, it dawned on me that um, even if they were to check the file, I bet nobody checks the questions, right? <laughs> like, I bet <laughs> the manager doesn't check if they passed. I bet, I mean, I'm, that's maybe a, a negative assumption, but um, the inspector certainly wouldn't, right? The, the most they'd be checking for is that this thing is in the file. Um, and so it, it, I think a store would learn fairly quickly that it is a meaningless exercise and just check some boxes, put it in a file, we're done. Right. Yeah, it's an honor system. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And I guess... Again, it is it, sort of putting it in the train the trainer type of of a situation that it kind of reinforces that the onus is on the permit holder and the manager to make sure that the employees are are following the regulations. Um, I don't think that costs them anything. I think that just I'm not sure actually. I don't know the answer to that question, but it didn't cost, it was a yeah, free. Yeah, it didn't, thing, it was free, yeah. Time. Yeah, it cost them their time. Their uh, time. So I have a question, would an online certificate, would that be something that the inspect office, I'm not quite sure what you call, would keep, keep a copy of that if it's just the owner, but would someone else from the inspector's office be sent a certificate if somebody did something online? I know. Again, my guess is that those would be on file with the the employee, um, you know, the, with the with the retailer. I'm not quite sure that's something we could ask about. But. Yeah, that's because it's something they keep with them, right? If they change jobs. So I suspect yeah. it goes in an employee file, they would either, you know, they might have another copy at home that they could take or they take that file when they leave. Mm -hmm. Don't think any copy goes to us or an inspector or, or any other regulatory. Mm -hmm. um, Maureen, did you say you mentioned an online quiz? Is it another um, municipality that does an online quiz? Yeah, well, that's that right? the, the Tri Town Health in in the Berkshires, and I think that's oh. like a, that's through that program for certification. There is actually um, a state the thing that covers all the state regulations that is online at the state tobacco site, and you know people could you utilize that to some degree. That we didn't really talk about that at our meeting with Sarah and Cheryl, but mm -hmm. that's that's another way of assessing people's knowledge about these rules but it doesn't it's obviously just for the state regulations which are the in some ways the critical ones you know the selling to a minor and what kinds of non what you know flavors and all of that um but there are the, but anyone would have access to that it's you, it's free you just go to the site and you just do it i think I, I tend to just just sort of putting out there where I lean on this. I, 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 I tend to not want to put bureaucracy if it doesn't add value. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, 
you know, asking them to pay something, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get a reaction um, from all of the vendors if they have to pay for a training that they didn't have to before. Um, having a state one feels risky to me because there are differences for our town. And so if they then come away with flavored papers, fine, and, and it's not here or, you know, those kinds of things that, that would worry me a little, I, I would tend to say, look, how you adhere to rules is really up to you. We can list some training options if that's something that, that would be helpful to you, but the, we are holding them accountable for the results, for them actually implementing the rules as they are in. And so it's in their best interest to know those and to make sure their their staff, I mean, I, I feel like we're getting a few levels of mandates that, that don't necessarily lead to the thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if other places mandate that kind of a session with the like what Sarah does for these for these retailers or if they seek that out because they want to be sure they're following the rules. Um, do you have a sense of that? We, should... I mean, we only know that the one just started mandating it. Um, sorry, I have to look at which name that is Medway. Um, but it sounds like it was something that was always on offer. So maybe people did. Yeah. Really take it. Yeah. I think the other thing that we, I had talked about with Steve McCarthy, who has who handles the tobacco licenses in OpenGov, which is the system that people use to apply for licenses, is you know we could conceivably integrate a quiz as a requirement of licensing. That in order to license, you have to submit the results of people having taken a quiz, maybe, I don't know if it's possible to build the quiz, quiz into OpenGov, like if it links you to an online platform and then people can take the quiz and then it's part of your application, that might be complicated to figure out from a tech standpoint. Maybe not something we can implement right away, but I guess that was a question I wanted to also pose is whether that is something that, as you said, Risha, let's not do bureaucracy if there's no you know, value in it, but if it's tied to making sure that all of your staff know stuff before you get issued a license and the proof that they know stuff is an online quiz that's connected to their license application, is that a route that people would want to go in? That's interesting. That that seems complicated to me, partly because of the the nature, I think, I may, I may be wrong, but I think the nature of the uh, establishments and how long their employees are with them and how many part-timers they might have. And um, and that keeping track of that seems onerous um, from the town's point of view, <laughs> um, again. Um, so the licensee is different from employee, right? So we are targeting employees to have this knowledge. Right. The licensee might be few people. Yeah, so I, I think and they They're must have this. They have to say they've read the regulations and understand them and yeah. whatever, I think. Right. And oftentimes, to your point, Tim, the licensees, the person who's filling out the application might not even be in the state. Yeah. You know, they're in yeah. Houston or something. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and the so. manager, I guess their manager, I guess those are the two uh, people that need to know because I if they're in Houston they don't know about Massachusetts rules that well or any other state you know how to keep track of that um so the three yeah. options um I'm just I'm just thinking um on the value so you have the training the trainer option we are still unsure about whether that trainer will transfer that information to a employee with diligence. So that's also a diligence questions there. Um, the online one, there is some cost involved. And we still don't know, you know, if that that information, maybe they will just pass and then still they may not uh, know what are some of the regulations. And I mean, just like any other online quiz, you know, so. Um, mm -hmm. And then what we have here is we are we are just guiding them to some sort of a state document to read, and then going through this quiz, you know. So 
still the same problems, you know, of whether mm -hmm. it will work or not. And um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, if, uh, if it's really not needed, um, we just provide it as a guidance saying that please take it um, and and the owner has now has a due diligence responsibility to ask the employees to take it. You know? So I think quiz may not help us much uh, because quiz is is not doing much. You know, so so just uh, you know having the instead of having a strict regulation, we just say as a, as some sort of a recommendation that all employees read the document and the owner now has to follow it through. I, that's you know, just removing it as a mandate. <laughs> hmm. And is this just for new licenses? I might be totally off, but is this just for new licenses or is this like, um, like in the past when someone took the quiz, was it when they first got a license to... The, the quiz should be taken for any new employee. Okay. And again, the, the only check on that would be if an inspector came and looked for it um, or if there was a violation and then they looked for it. So there, there was no record that anyone's taken it um, until someone looks. Uh, but yeah, it, it'd be for existing license holders anytime someone new starts working there. And I guess the I I don't know, but I would guess that the train the trainer might be an annual thing that the that the uh because the, the license is renewed annually um, that that the permit holder and the manager would take, but I actually don't know the answer to that either. <laughs> the more you dig, the more questions come up. Um, I don't know the answer to that either. I actually would have assumed the opposite, which is that it's one, one. Yeah, one time. But, you know, part of this is it hasn't started yet. Medway just adopted it. So mm -hmm. um, we don't know that yet. I mean, I'm sure it's written, but. Yeah, I mean, from Tim's, like in Tim's uh approach to say you're responsible here's some things you can do to help yourself uh avoid uh, making mistakes having your employee make mistakes or, or not understand the rules and um to avoid penalties for those things so uh, there are some options yeah that sounds of what I, we know, it sounds like the way forward to me as well. Well, I would just wonder too, um, in the past when there was the in-person quiz, did the office that, you know, gives out the quiz, can't they just make a copy of it? Like, I always, I you think know, know that. The for, it was us that created the quiz. The Board of Health created the quiz mm -hmm. and promulgated it to the person who holds the license so they could help their new employees learn the rules of tobacco sales. So it 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 is the onus was on us to kind of keep that up to date, as Risha was mentioning. But it it never touched a regulator's hand. So it, you know, I provided the link for you guys. They would also have that link. They would down the, the owner manager would download it for the new hire, have them take it, put it in a file. Not nobody from the town ever had any contact with how it's being used or um, until inspections happen. And to our knowledge, that they're not being inspected uh, for that particular piece of paper. Okay, I'm but my to think. Oh, sorry. Oh, I just had a question. Do we keep a copy of the quiz? Well, that's what I'm saying. We never see the quiz. It it is downloaded from the internet into the manager's hand, given to the uh, employee. It, it never touches us or the town. Yeah, the current regulations say that 
employees have to pass the quiz and the employer has to keep on file a copy of the quiz. So that's all that happens. And we don't check it after that. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is, do we keep that in the regulations or do we take that out? Like, do we keep it in and fix it so it's more effective or do we take it out? Is that the question on the table? Just checking. I think so. Yeah. Can I say something? Go ahead. Um, I'm just inclined to think if there's no um, way to monitor follow through on, on these regulations, whether it's quiz or an online thing, then, you know, Tim's uh, suggestion does make sense. It's here are three different ways you can do it. The one concern that I have is that the Massachusetts, sorry, Amherst's regulations are broader. And, you know, perhaps the um, licensee should, you know, just be clearly instructed that there are some differences and it's your responsibility to know, you know, if you choose to take the state test, I mean, I mean, the online one. Uh, it, to me, that would be the only piece that would be a disadvantage because, you know, you could hide behind. If they choose to take an online test that doesn't cover all the regulations, then they can plead ignorance. But if you make it clear or it's made clear to the licensee um, that it's their responsibility, you know, then legally you have a leg to stand on, I guess. I mean, it, it, it is their responsibility. There's no question about that. It's no, just... I just, I'm talking about specific, uh, uh, well, options. But maybe there is already a, a preamble in whatever they read that says, you're responsible for knowing all of this, in which case then, you know, the question I raise is moot. If, if there is already, then then just, you know, I think it makes sense to let them have a choice of how they do it. I, I, I Just rephrasing what Premila was saying, uh, primarily giving them that freedom to comply by giving some sort of an options for them. Um, and one of the option in the online one, specifically saying there's so many differences, you know, uh, between towns and between states. So, so I think having that qualifiers somewhere there and it will be useful for the, for the licensee to actually select what, what options they are going to choose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it time for someone to move? Should I move to get rid of the quiz and replace it with um, language that says, if you would like support in training your staff, these are options, um, but, but know that some of the state ones might differ from specific town ones? This sounds a little too, I'm sorry. I should wait. Does anybody have a second? I second it. I guess we can have a, a bit of discussion. Um, I just feel that's a little too vague for a motion because we're not saying what we're actually doing. And um, maybe we should work on, on the sidelines of bringing a motion back on this. But I, I don't know. I mean, it, it just oh. seems like we could just say we're not doing this but not we don't we need what we're replacing if we're going to actually have a motion to say that i think okay i think that's a that's a good clarification so is it enough to say we all agree that this is the direction we'd like to go in we then put that into the revised draft that gets reviewed by all of us and we vote on it then once it, once we see the draft so all we need to know is that's the direction we're going that doesn't need a motion I think that makes sense to me as, all right, so. Excuse me, um, I was just trying to add the options all include some form of a quiz and they can decide how they train their employees, how they, on the on their requirements, um, whether it be online quiz, whether it be someone from 
inspection that comes and helps them train their employees. I just, I don't know if we're getting rid of the whole idea of a quiz or if somebody can clarify that for me. I th I think what I was suggesting based on what I was hearing was getting rid of the quiz, that that's not something we would keep updated um, and we would take that away as a requirement. That leaves the onus on them, which it always was, but to figure out how to make sure that their staff know enough to adhere to the regulations and we can just give them resources that are available if they want help doing that. But not mandate anything and not check anything, which you know, we aren't doing now. So so the issue again is updating, keeping things updated. Cause I, I think a quiz is a type of resource. So we can go in either way, but I I like the quiz as a resource. But if other people don't, okay. Well it's a resource but it's mandated and then and then there's no enforcement of it, which feels like a not so well, yeah so we could it could be a resource that we can provide here's an example of a quiz you could do but we're not going to say it's a requirement because we're not following up on it so why require something that we're not enforcing that feels just pointless i think that's what you're saying Risha. so yes include it as a resource but don't don't require it although then it would have to be kept up to date too <laughs> so that's well, yeah that, so that's right that's not that hard that's not that yeah, hard right that's better than saying that's, we have to go out there and check these things every couple of months which is just not realistic you know with staff turnover and all that kind of stuff so it not it need not be in a quiz form we can just translate that into a fact sheet mm -hmm. and then you know that fact sheet could be a resource you know so yeah okay. we could we, yeah. we could make you a simple five version of the regulation. Yep. Exactly. Aimed at an employee who's actually at the counter, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a motion on the table. Should we what do we do with it? <laughs> I think I think you clarified that we don't really need a motion. What we need is maybe, and I don't know the the correct terms for this, but like some way a vote of of indicating that this is the direction we want to go in and that on the side uh, i or you will try to work up the wording mm -hmm. and then submit it back for review yeah yeah i don't think we yeah. i think we can withdraw the motion and just hold on to the idea and and um put the put the word put put it into some wording and go from there but yeah, and I just want to make sure that, it, you know, me as the loudest person is not making the decision. Is everyone feeling like this is the right direction to be going in? So we're taking away the mandate. We will keep some resource that we create specifically for Amherst, and we can point them to others that exist. Does that feel like what everyone wants to do? I see a yes? I I just feel like, you know, if it, the onus is on the employee, a quiz might be helpful. And I don't think that, you know, we should try to get away from that just because we, you know, want to change the way that we're doing things. Like, I just, I just feel like, again, when I looked at the quiz, there were things that I didn't know and there might be, it just might be helpful to be in a, a quiz form. That could be uh, some sort of resource. So I, I would not, agree, I'm not agreeing to getting rid of a quiz as a resource, but I'm not the one doing the, the final work. So Are you, I, didn't I just want to, I thought we were saying that the quiz would be one of the options. At least that's what um, Risha was saying. Am I wrong? I mean, I think initially we thought we would ditch the quiz, but if the quiz can be kept as an option, the only issue would be needing to update it. But, but, um, you know, it just seems to me that if if we're not checking, it doesn't make sense to mandate something. Yeah. So I was yeah, going to ask gonna... Lauren, would Lauren, you be comfortable? Do you want to keep the mandate? Or are you comfortable just keeping it as a 
no, you because you 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 clarified that um there's no one to you know uphold or or follow through with you know mandating something that is not being followed through, you know, as you know, either an inspector going out and seeing if they took the quiz or passed the quiz or, you know, um, but I just, um, I'm not, I'm just saying that I think a quiz form in some form could be still part of a resource. Okay, then, then I think what I'm hearing is that we're all on the same page. So we'll, we'll keep the resource, drop the mandate. Mm -hmm. That took a long time. <laughs> as, as these things do. <laughs> I'm wondering if um, maybe we, I don't know how flexible the agenda is, but uh, do we might not have time to go through another one. It, I wonder if there's a simple one that seems simple. The cigar <laughs> if, one seems simplest to me. I would say, let's try to take that on. We'll do chip the way at these things. Okay, so um, if you scroll to the very last, bit um and i'm trying to find it okay so currently our cigar so we just background uh there are minimums for single cigars so that they don't sort of appeal to younger people who don't have as much money as really easy things to buy i'm sure that can be said better if someone wants to to do that um the our current is Two fifty, two dollars and fifty cents for a single cigar, and um, minimum five dollars for two or more cigars. And the the state ones have those prices at two ninety instead of two fifty, and five eighty instead of five. And they are saying that the reason for that change is inflation, and it's up to us if we want to mirror that. So the decision is to keep our current prices or raise them to uh, the state level prices. And again, these are minimums. We aren't setting their actual prices. Uh, I I don't know how go, how they got those very nice numbers, 2.9 and 5.8. It looks like really um, based on some baseline and then they added like three percent five percent like that so yeah i i think you know keeping some sort of a rounded numbers is much easier you know um is, are you voting either we going i'm just saying you know we go with what we have right now or round it to like a three dollars or six dollars like that if you really wanted to increase the price and i guess one point that i didn't say is our our prices match what their prices used to be. So the the base that they were using is the same as we use now. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, your point is taken. That round is much easier to remember. I guess the thing comes up as the inspector's issue too, though, if we're following along with, I don't think that says we can't do that because I think what, 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 Meredith O'Leary does is she looks at our everybody's town's regulations who are part of this Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition and and just tells the inspectors what they are like the prices is you know so we we can do what we want um, is it easier in some ways to stick with the state that's a question but I I don't think I don't think that should be a heavy I wait on on this discussion, but it's one of the things to think about. Uh, um, following up on Risha's uh, original comment on you know having higher price so that the younger users will be discouraged, right? I'm just curious if two dollars ninety cents is a discouragement for <laughs> I mean. In, you know, you are creating some sort of economic disincentive, right, for them not to use it. You know, for, you know but uh, if that small difference will make big difference for them, you know. So, but 
But if if that is a purpose of this pricing, maybe a, a rounded higher price is much more appealing than a lower price, keeping the price at 250. You know? So if you want to do that, then we can have uh, two dollars and ninety cents or three dollars, you know, for single cigar. It does make sense to me to account for inflation. So, uh, you know, I would be inclined to think it should be increased. Something to be said for uniformity in terms of the state's uh, pricing. But, you know, I totally get what you say, Tim. It is easier to make it um, $3 and uh, $6. If uh, neighboring towns are having two ninety and and we are having three dollars, I think probably the youth will go out of the town, right, to buy that <laughs> to I, save I the ten cents, so. right? No. <laughs> Just good. <laughs> but I, I think I, I, I I'm favoring like a price increase, but rounded rounded price, you know, so it's easy to monitor and inspect it. I actually, I, I think your price, your your comment there about price differentials from the neighboring towns is not, it, it's not just a joke. I mean, I, I think we don't want to put our vendors at a, a, a disadvantage point. Um, so you've actually convinced me to, <laughs> to adhere to the state numbers rather than round up, but yeah. <laughs> And I think, I mean, although it seems easier to say, oh, it's three and six, the state and the inspectors are going to know the 290 and, and 580 by heart. So um, I guess I favor raising them and maybe sticking with the state at this point. It just seemed like it would be A, more uniform, and B, less complicated. <clears throat> So I would agree. Any other discussion? I think this is something we could make a motion on tonight. I would say let's be right. uniform and just say we will put this in the final and that's something that everyone, we vote on the final. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just say so far, we agree that we'll we'll move them up to the MAHB suggested prices. And we'll keep track of all these these decisions along the way. All right. So I would guess that's the time we have for this discussion. I think so. I think the partly is the other two of the other questions are really complicated, I think, or going to be a longer discussion. So we'll save those for a special day. <laughs> um, all those wraps are confusing. Um, all right. So if that's good. Um, so we made some progress on these things. That's good. Let me get them out of the way. Our, our next um Maureen, item. can I just ask? Um, so then do we do we feel like we're not yet in the position of wanting to invite an expert to the next meeting? We want to get some more questions or tell me I, what, think. what do you think, Risha? Uh it might, I mean, if they're willing to, I hate to waste their time if, if you know, we don't end up having a lot of questions, but I, I think Maureen is right that people are, it might be helpful to have people with deep understanding of, of flavored wraps and the, I agree. Uh, it, it's a complicated, more complicated than cigar pricing. Right. And I, and 
they know a lot more about these issues than you or I. So I think this is, I think getting some of these things kind of cleared out of the way will leave discussion of the ones that are more difficult. And um, and if there is, it, we'll try to provide information to people ahead of the next meeting where we discuss this to kind of get, wrap their heads around it a little bit. <laughs> um, and hope, I think we might have some more also of uh, an update of the our regulations and to, to kind of be able to see them all together and where these fit in. Um, okay, so you do anticipate that the RAPS discussion would be at the next meeting and it would be good to have somebody like Sarah or Cheryl there. Yeah, unless okay. there's something that's major that comes up between now and then that bumps these ahead. I think this might be great to move along on, on, okay. the, on the real meat of these changes. Got it. Okay, great. Okay, so... So we'll move to to the playground surfacing question, and I'll just introduce it a little bit. Um, I think we had from our last discussion. I think people are familiar with this. And since then, in in the interval, um, uh, Kiko has had a chance to speak with Lindsay Pollard and Rachel Massey from the Lowell Center for Sustainable Planning, um, formerly known as TURI, and uh, also Diana Zuckerman, who is the president of the National Center for Health Research, which is a think tank that uh, looks at these issues of, of health risks in, in, the, in the community, particularly they look at lead. Um, uh, okay, so Tim is going to kind of summarize some of these issues for us, and then we can have maybe a, a little bit more discussion. Uh, one of the things I meant to say is that while we invited people from this Lowell Center, it's no longer free because things changed about their grant and they are no longer really supported by Massachusetts. They're reported by Pen some people in Pennsylvania, but the discussions nonetheless were really, really helpful. So um, I'll let Tim go ahead. Just, but just to clarify on that, so Lindsay Pollard and Rachel Massey are the folks who authored that December 2023 report from Turi about playground services. They're the people who wrote that. Mm -hmm. And they're researchers that were affiliated with Turi. So Turi still exists. It's just their affiliation has changed. They, their research affiliation has changed. They're now with the Lowell Center for Sustainable Planning, still at UMass Lowell. So they just, you know, researchers sometimes have to chase funding streams. So they're in a different place and their funding doesn't allow them to do work in Massachusetts anymore. That's why they're in the position of having to charge. They're, they they want to try to change it, but right now it's hard for them to do work in Massachusetts because they're funded to do work in Pennsylvania. So I don't know if anybody noticed, but Lindsay Pollard was an attendee, uh, but we lost her to the lengthy tobacco description. Oh, so no. it's not an attendee anymore. Oh, oh, I that's don't too know. Bad. I didn't realize. Wow, Premal. I, I saw her name under the attendees, so oh, that's dear. unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. I think we have to be better about sticking to our agenda times next time. So mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I'll turn it over to Tim. Well, this is a quick overview. I I know that there were some discussions in last meeting, uh, but. Based on my just uh, reading, and I just compiled some some notes, um, both from literature, but also from uh, general articles which are reliable. You know, um, so so much of these playground surfaces are derived from some sort of recycled tires. Um, so these are materials that are usually associated with a variety of ingredients like which are probably toxic in ingredients 
uh, especially heavy metals of uh, and uh, literature has uh, a lot of uh, observation on high amount of zinc. Uh, uh, lead is also had been observed. Um, volatile organic compounds um, are of uh, uh, and also se semi volatile organic compounds. These are uh, also uh, associated with these materials when it, they get heated. Um, uh, when during the hot days, uh, usually they get volatile. volatile these uh, you know these are emitting, and uh, and then there's also particulates and uh, polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons also also PAHs are also uh, associated with this material. So there are several observations, both global, but also uh, in specific uh, places like Korea and Spain. They had been. Um, doing some sort of a lot of research on trying to find what are some of the contaminants um, either leaching out but also uh, uh, in the emissions um, and and once the uh, material get degraded you also have some sort of a, these materials now entering into soils and run of water and then I, I think in last meeting i saw the minutes they were also talking about um, potential pathogens associated with this uh, these materials. Um, there are some concerns about these tire crumbs and also synthetic turf fields having uh, partial possible exposure to microbial pathogens, uh, especially one of which of concern is the MRSA uh, strain, which is uh, um, which is a, resist, a resistant version. And so, so there are a lot of concerns about you know what are the um, uh, influences of these um, uh, and and their impact on the health uh, and the risk of this export chemicals. Um, and um, I know the Turi had some nice uh, compilation of reports about what are some of the alternatives and uh, what are some of the specific uh, contaminants of concern uh, from from this material, so I just want to highlight some studies, um, and then uh, I will I will give my opinion on how we could actually go forward forward with that. So one of the study which was which came out um, more recently in the Science of Total Environment, they they had been looking at some of the uh, the so this is a global evaluation of looking at crumb rubber um, worldwide. Uh, used in uh, synthetic turf football pitches. So this is a worldwide study. Uh, they assessed 42 organic compounds and um, and they found uh, the presence of uh, PAH. Uh, these are hydrocarbons um, in many of the samples they collected. Um, and some of them are endocrine disruptors, uh, uh, like for example, plasticizers and so, uh, there is some sort of a presence of hazardous chemicals in, in these types of recycled uh, uh, materials. They found, uh, so this is samples uh, which were throughout the, throughout the world. Um, the second study, which was also more recent uh, in chemosphere, um, they were actually assessing um, uh, synthetic turf, uh, primarily in the, in the angle of uh, end of life tires and how it impacts in a circular economy type of a perspective, and they observed uh, uh, zinc occurrence of zinc, iron, magnesium, aluminium, uh, chromium, lead. Um, uh, especially, uh, have potential implications for you know a, a significant to younger adults, younger individuals, who are usually associated with those you know, playgrounds. Um, there's another study more recent. These are all 2022 studies, which, are, which came out like a year ago. Um, uh, this is in about you know, how it translates into soil and water contamination. Um, uh, so this study uh, came out in polymers, which were actually evaluating and they measured uh, some of the increased in con concentration of zinc, uh, PAH, which is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, in freshwater organisms. So there is some sort of a aquatic ecosystem impacts when they are leached out or washed out 
uh, washed off from the location. Um, the other, another study, which is like a two years ago, uh, which was uh, focused on crumb rubber, um, uh, they found that um, they some of those recycled surfaces, which they actually met some of the European Commission's uh, um, uh, standards, but some of them, specific ones, they exceeded several, in some specific cases, uh, exceeded the allowable limits, uh, especially endocrine disruptors, um, which were uh, reaching parts per million concentration. So, um, and then the, the lastly, I want to uh, mention, uh, this also came in uh, just last year, um, they did a ecological one health impact of these potential toxic uh, substances of recreational crumb, rub crumb rubber crumb, you know, uh, materials. And um, they found that they are essentially um, uh, released during some sort of the play and sports activities and how some of the maintenance procedures and, um, and also natural weathering also can enhance some of these substances to um, uh, leach and also uh, em emit during some hot surfaces. So, so these are some, but still the science behind it is slowly uh, catching up with this one because there's a heavy uh, influence of, there's so much popular, it's becoming very popular and people are using it, but also there's concern and then the science is catching up with a lot of studies em emerging. Um, so one um, motivation on why this, this has used is to actually have uh, less, amount of injury, injuries uh, to the falls or bruising and everything, uh, having some sort of a cushioning when there is some sort of a fall, like a 10 feet fall or something. Um, but that is the that is some sort of a benefits on one side and then you have the costs of uh, others. So you have crumb rubber uh, and then you also have pour in place type of plastic you know, or rubbers, uh, which also have a little bit compacted, they are not like loosely uh, moving around, but they have some sort of a, one concern is the duration, how long they last, once they last and they become you know hardened and the edges will start to crumble and uh, um, it still could have some sort of issues uh, when the uh, life of that particular pour in, a pour in uh, place type of rubber uh, is uh, coming to the end, end of that life lifespan. So these are some concerns and often um, the, the decision makers have to weigh in between these two things. Do we actually have uh, uh, benefits of actually preventing any type of bruising and cushioning of some of the place and everything, but you also have long-term implications of contaminants emanating, leaching and running off. And so, so that is where the value comes in and uh, in terms of the decision maker. So, should we adopt it by weighing in these two pros and cons? And, uh, and uh, as a board of health, one thing we, we, we focus more on the public health side of things and having some sort of our opinion and also having some sort of our statement out there will be always helpful on the public health concerns of these installations. So, that's what my my take on this is. Thank you. There's some other things that from those conversations that I might also want to highlight, and um, the the fact is that the poured in place rubber uh installations are it's not one size fits all it really depends on the on the manuf the installer and the specific types of materials that they're using and they can it can vary quite a bit with in terms of what kinds of rubber is in there whether it's crumb rubber whether it's what so-called virgin rubber whether how it's installed is really came from the, the the folks from Tory. And so it's like, it, it, you can't just say, or it, it's it's really many different things. Uh, plan. 
a lot of Maureen, questions as to know Maureen, what, what they're Maureen, doing. Maureen, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're breaking up a bit. So we're missing chunks of what you're saying. Well, am I been muted? This? No. Okay. Okay. No, it's you're not um, muted, but you're breaking up what? a lot. So we're missing oh, big I don't chunks know what's going of on. what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's just, I guess it's just the same. Was not, one size doesn't fit all. When you go from one company to another, you should ask questions and know what you're getting. Um, another thing that just came out is that recently that the EU has uh, banned the continued use of crumb rubber in athletic fields and they're phasing it out. I guess if you have an athletic field, um, you can keep using it for the next eight years, but then they're, that's going to be gone. It all, they're also banning it in a lot of other products, but that one was the relevant one to, to our discussion. So like Tim was saying, the, the science is kind of moving in a direction now that's, that's, a, that's questioning the use of in around children and, and in the environment. Um, I think advocate of engine. So Maureen, can you hear me? It's Kiko. Um, can you hear me? Were, you, you were coming in loud and clear for a little while and then you started breaking up again. Oh, so what's going on? You, you might want to try turning off your I camera. I see that it's breaking. Yeah, if you turn off your camera, sometimes that increases your bandwidth for sound. You could try that, see if that helps. No, um, and I see that Risha, uh, Risha yeah, has her hand up. I don't know if you can see that. Pico, uh, I can't. I, it was all, everything was fro frozen. Okay. Pico, uh, Lauren is in attendees, you know. I think you have to promote There's the panel. The video oh. button. Oh, I can do that. I'm sorry. I didn't see Thanks, that. Kyle. Thanks for noticing that, Tim. Um, so Maureen, while you're fiddling with that, can we hear from Risha while you're trying to get yourself? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Well, I don't have uh, anything to add. I have questions. Um, and Tim, thank you for that, because I, I have um, struggled to get my head around some of these, and it's useful to hear the summary. Um, I, I, w I just wanted to understand the, the, uh, the studies that you quoted. Are they all on one type? But towards the end, then you mentioned uh, the port in place, but were the, were the first studies all about crumble? Yeah, uh, most of them are for crumble, uh, crumble rubber. Um, so the first five studies I mentioned are uh, tire crumb rubber studies. Um, but they have used, so this is one of the big ingre ingredients in, in many of the playgrounds, you know. So they are studying worldwide. And I believe um, um, I don't think I have, uh, yeah, uh, all of them are crumb rubber, primarily these studies. Okay. okay. And then what what are the limits of what we can do? What are the, I, I wanna make sure before we, I, I start thinking about, you know, solutions or, or recommendations, what, it, we can't mandate anything, right? So we could make a recommendation that they avoid X or that they adopt Y, or is that the, where we're heading with this? So my, I mean, the, uh, the couple of, uh, um, outcomes in of what we are going to do. So I think we are going to highlight uh, the public health concerns related to this. Of course, there are other values and benefits for students and playing and everything, but our focus is on public health. And the recommendation is to actually be aware of this when they are making a decision and then try to find um, mitigation options to avoid any type of a uh, uh, excess contamination or exposure or um, exposure for children and everything or youth. Uh, or the other option is to actually find alternatives, like they were, they were talking about cork-based playgrounds. You know? so, so giving them some sort of a suggestion on the board, you know, on the public health angle uh, and, 
and making the suggestion that you know this uh, the decision makers should seriously consider uh, the implications, the environmental implications, the health implications of these decisions. Yeah, and I think it's. I'm, I'm glad you uh, clarified that public health includes the environmental health um, yeah. and presumably the injuries. Yeah. As well as and yeah chemicals. Okay, that's all I had. Yeah, actually, can I, I see Premila's hands is up. I don't know how Maureen is doing. So I'm just going to say one thing um, in response to your question, Risha, which is that um, the, the Board of Health did make a motion about artificial turf before you joined the board. And the wording is basically given the responsibility of the Board of Health under the Massachusetts general laws and under the um, for the protection of the public's health and the protection of the environment, using the precautionary principle that states of a product and action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, protective action should be taken, and that the Board of Health does not support the installation of artificial turf. So that was the wording that was done before. And I think what the board is talking about is something similar for this situation. And Maureen, it looks like you're back. Can we hear, are you? Maureen, it looks like you're back. Can we hear you? I got it. I think Maureen is joining from two devices probably. So that's why we're hearing the echo. Um, Premila, do you wanna make your comment while she's trying to get back on? Sure. Um, I just, uh, two things. One is, uh, I think my understanding is that we're, we are all, can only make a recommendation and that's what we're doing. And I, I the wording that you use for PFAS. So it seems to me, yes, you know, that instead of specifying an alternative that we should, you know, urge them if that's what we decided and agree upon to not use this particular product and to explore other um alternatives uh, you know again because because of uh, the our mandate being health basically um the other thing i wondered is you know the the other rubber products Tim, maybe this is a question for you. I mean, I'm sure there are different types of rubber, but I'm assuming, maybe incorrectly, that they all have the potential for toxic chemicals and uh, <clears throat> VOCs and, you know, if the studies are only, I mean, are there no studies on other products or... Oh, the... Is a question for me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I specifically focused on crumb rubber, which has been published uh, more, you know, in the past couple of years, I think there is a uh, lot of interest in environmental implications in soil and water and aquatic ecosystems. Um, so there are, and I, I haven't looked at other studies where they have substituted is recycled crumb rubber with other products, like like a virgin rubber or other other um, others which are not recycled from some other uh, commodities like tires, you know, because for tire wear and tear they add a lot of those contaminants, you know, and when you recycle them they are coming into this this um, uh, crumb rubber uh, compound. So um, I, I think you know Maureen mentioned this that uh, uh, some of the companies which are actually producing this they have some sort of different ingredients some of them have recycled rubber recycled tires some of them have a mix some of them have you know, pure you know uh, virgin rubber which which um, which could have some sort of a um, uh, contaminants but they may not be uh, as severe as the recycled crumb rubber, uh, which is coming from the tires recycled. So, uh, so I agree. Uh, I think you mentioned that rec our recommendation should not include specific products, alternate products, but give them that particular option of saying, try to look for some sort of an alternatives which are 
having lesser uh, impacts of the environment and the health. So, Maureen, are you back? Can you? I hear think us? so. Can Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes, I so far so good. To my phone hotspot and. That seems to be working better since I'm at my daughter's house and the internet is not always, I don't know, stable. Mm -hmm. um, so Maureen, you and Tim had actually uh, wordsmithed a statement that was um, with starting with the same sort of text that I read that was similar to the beginning of that artificial turf statement about the precautionary principle and the responsibility mm -hmm. of the board and then saying something about um, advising that you avoid or limit the use of materials that contain certain chemicals, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, heavy metals, microplastics, PAHs, um, which are polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, and, and that cr those are things that are present in from rubber, um, and also to some degree in, in other types of rubber. So that was kind of the idea was that it would be a statement like that, avoid materials with these kinds of chemicals. Um, but then I think the question is along the lines of what you were asking, Premila, is it just, there's a lot of evidence that crumb rubber is really quite awful. And then other synthetic rubbers, maybe not as much evidence, but still some evidence that it's not the best, um, you know, it's not the safest. So would we, would the board want to issue a statement just about crumb rubber or would it be about all kinds of rubber. As in port in place rubber. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because we do, I mean, the Turi folks and also Diana Zuckerman, who I spoke to, and, and you mentioned this also, Tim, is that even if the unitary surface is not as bad as what's underneath, the what's underneath can come up through that unitary surface. It get the wear and tear on it, especially in spots where kids are playing a lot, like the underneath a slide where there's a lot of um, you know, impact over years that that crumb rubber, they don't last as long as maybe people think and that what's underneath is really a concern that uh, quite a toxic material that's underneath. And knowing what we, what uh, uh, Tim has told us about the studies about crumb rubber, it, it seems to me that, you know, to use any rubber, you'd want to make sure that it didn't have the contaminants that crumb rubber has. And, you know, if there aren't any studies, then the um, the manufacturer is not going to be able to prove that. So it just seems to me, logically, if this is true about crumb rubber, that it would make sense to look at the other products available. I guess that's really the question, I think, in terms of do we want to make a statement like that, that whether to avoid crumb rubber or all types of rubber that might be uh, problematic in this kind of use. I, I, I don't know. I... Um... I'm really struck by how awful all of them are. I mean, that, that there didn't seem to be a single good option on the tables that, that are in the various reports. I mean, they all have, um, I find myself being like, let the kids get hurt. I, I don't want them to end. Uh, you can at least fix an ankle. Um, but I think, you know, I, I talked about mold concerns last time. I mean, there there are such a wide variety of negatives on almost all of these surfaces. The one that stands out to me is anything using recycled tires. Um, that, that feels like the worst of the worst. Um, and, and the, the best of the things seems like a relatively, the, the, is it the board in cork or the something in cork? Piece. Um, you know, is outrageously expensive. And so it's not. Well, it's incrementally expensive, I think. I think that I think they set up to a hundred thousand dollars more, but I think the price of the board in place rubber is somewhere in the range of a million dollars for that installation. I just and I just want to say that I really do think we need to focus on all the health aspects, not the price. I agree. 
I hear you. I just, I don't want to make a statement that gives them nowhere to go. Um, well, there know. are alternatives, you know, and, and none of them are perfect. You're absolutely right. Um, but it seems to me, even if we used a different type of rubber, not enough is known. And it's, it would be strange to say, well, I mean, they, they, I guess the, they're, the Conservation Commission um, statement was about port in place rubber. And uh, that it just makes sense to me in terms of, avoid, of avoiding, you know, environmental damage and, and damage to children's health. Yes, there are other concerns, but, um, you know, there are, in terms of falls, maybe, uh, you know, the, the cork product, but, um, there are other places that have installed the pork product and obviously there are rules in terms of you know height to prevent falls and so on and or, or injury from falls and uh, you know that particular product met those requirements um maybe the uh, the uh wood fiber did too but you know I, I'm just saying that these things that are in use, I, I, I'm I'm less inclined to think that uh, the cork issue it, it, or the bonded wood fibers or uh, are definitely unsafe. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know again, I mean. It's our job not, it's not our job to find alternatives. It's our job to comment on what, or, or we've been asked to comment rather, on what's being proposed. Uh, you know, I get it. I, I, I wouldn't want to be some the person who has to decide, well, then what are we going to do with the money that we have? But- And is what's being proposed poured in place? Is there a specific in place rubber? Yep. Well, that I I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, at the last meeting, uh, Maureen, correct me if I'm wrong. That's the term she used, and I think that the plan was to use crumb rubber, but but she pointed out that there were alternatives uh, uh, in terms of the type of rubber. My understanding about this is that there was a discuss they a lot of discussions or earlier, maybe with even almost a year ago, um, about what type of surface. And they went through a lot of discussion about options and came down on the idea that the that the a poured in place rubber, and it wasn't specified which types of materials would be included in that. I think that wasn't I, as my understanding is that the the that wasn't down to that specificity. And then these questions came up just in the last couple of months, like December, November, December, uh, the, the concern about the use of this, these rubber materials in this sensitive site and with other issues around children as well. Um, and so that's, it's kind of, Kick, you know, kick the, kick the problem open again. So I don't think anything's been decided. I think it's really not finalized and it won't, but it will be soon. It, it needs to be soon, finalized soon. Yeah, so just to add some information and to clarify that. So the Conservation Commission was not happy about the port in place playground for uh, largely for environmental reasons. And so they port were in asked- place rubber, you mean? Port in place rubber, yes, sorry. Um, so they approved the order of conditions to move forward with the project without a decision having been made about the playground surface so that other aspects of the work could continue. So now it's up to the design committee and the town to decide what playground surface will be used, and then they'll have to come back to Conservation Commission for it to be approved. So Maureen's right that it's in a holding pattern, um, but, but there was definitely concern expressed about port in place rubber by the Conservation Commission. That's why they approved it without that decision having been made. 
So th this is how it's an opportunity for the Board of Health to also weigh in, as you keep saying, Pramila, about the health issues. You know, what are the health things, the chemicals that the board is concerned about that these surfaces might contain? <clears throat> Excuse me. Can, can I just ask a couple of questions? Um, I, I don't know how long we want to stay on this topic, but um, we had mentioned some other playgrounds um, such as the new Groff Park. And I'm just wondering, was the same um, delineation or contemplation thought of, you know, for that park? And if not, why not? Um, and also, I had mentioned before, even though I do not know a lot about, you know, all the materials is Drainage was a, a issue that I brought up and I know that you had, we all have expressed that it's the designers who are going to have to make all these final decisions, but I don't know if that is a issue that they'll have to look at or if that's an important issue of like the drainage. And um, yeah, I just, I just, want to wanted to add that um I'm just from my reading i just want to say that drainage is apparently better with porkin than with rubber poured in place and um this isn't necessarily drainage but i think it was runoff that was the issue also for the I think it was it was runoff, but also it was runoff that was primarily the concern for the Conservation Commission or a concern of the Conservation Commission, which resulted in them. And I, I'm not I know that drainage and runoff are completely different terms, but um, I, I just wanted to point that out that runoff is an issue. Other comments or questions? I think in uh, in the pour in place uh, option, of course, the crumb rubber is some sort of a, um, I would say, some sort of a glue together, I would say, so that they, they, they don't fly around. Uh, um, so there are a couple of I think, you know, so if it is made of crumb rubber, that which is actually recycled rubber, versus a, a virgin rubber, which is actually has less contamination. So those are some of the options they can think about, have some sort of a uh, material which has, which which is tested and doesn't have any type of a, uh, potential health assets. Um, the other thing I think they were mentioning about the runoff, um, uh, if I if I'm correct, you know, I think it's it's probably affecting Fort River, um, mm -hmm. but um, that will be the same case if you put a parking lot or a or a house, <laughs> it will also have runoff, you know. So uh, so that may not be a good argument right away, but if it's going to be a very extensive playground with completely impervious runoff, there might be more water running off of that, having downstream sediment loss and stuff like that. So that's one potential implications of this pour in, pour, you know, pour in place uh, rubber compounds. Does the fact that um, the leaching of, of materials into the, that space more yeah, of a that, concern? So um, it it actually happens. I think the, uh, the leaching, when it starts to the installation starts to get to the end of life, you know, that's when I think most of the impacts are going to happen. And I think when it's installed, it, it may not because it's all uh, by, bound together, you know, the individual particles, you know. So, uh, but. Um, uh, the the how much is the lifespan of that particular installation? Uh, some people say you know whatever is 
being uh, designed for and, and promised in the manufacture side is always not true. They, they just uh, start to degrade very early. So when they are degrading, I think the edges are something which will start to uh, disintegrate and start to enter into your runoff. Um, so that's where I think we will see. And the, leach, the leachates potentially coming out are usually those uh, uh, those areas where that it starts to disintegrate, especially when it is exposed to freezing and thawing and some of the areas will start to see the, 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 it's actually breaking apart and those are the where you might see some sort of a leachate entering it uh, entering through the infiltrating water. Um, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, are we at a point of making a, a decision or pr proposing a motion? One suggestion I would make is uh, we have to be uh, we we have we make decisions about evidence based, you know. So we don't want to have some sort of very generic. So all rubber is bad or something like that. So we just uh, we know that there is um, uh, evidence on some sort of a contaminants in the crumb rubber, and use of them in any type of a design. Um, is some sort of a not desirable. So I'm more in the favor of not having a very blanket type of a uh, recommendation of every rubber because we have automobiles having tires, you know, they're all rubber. Um, so instead of that, if we just focus on the crumb rubber as our main main uh, uh, opinion, I think that will be much more impactful, you know, so. Do you want to make a motion to that effect? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Let's see. Maureen, were you trying to say something? Sorry. No, I did. I wasn't sure if that was directed to me or to you. Tim, the question. I was directing that to Tim. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I I think you know. Uh, we we have two options for making a motion. One is focusing on crumb rubber based on the studies I, I mentioned, or having the second option, which is actually for um, uh, any type of a uh, uh, rubber, you know, which is actually um, Use of synthetic uh -huh. rubber products, any synthetic, does not support the use of any synthetic rubber products. That is the second option. Uh, well, no, I, I, well, I was thinking more just poured in place rubber. I wasn't, I mean, I know rubber's widely used. So anyway, that's, I mean, I can certainly live with uh, uh, crumb rubber specification. Um, that's that's okay too it just you know who knows what else they'll come up with and what the issues are with that but that's another conversation i guess and and i apologize i i am actually going to have to hop off at exactly the half hour but um the what i heard the first pitch or the first motion was to focus on the chemicals not the so the outputs versus the inputs right so we are we would be recommending against anything that has like PAH or VOCs or, or heavy metals. Um, and that, you know, if there are alternatives that say they're rubber and don't have those things, you know, that, that that's not where we're getting into. We're just getting into the, that these chemicals are bad and should be avoided. I don't know how practical that is because I don't know how the testing what how how much those other things are tested 
for the various chemicals. So I think it would almost be saying there's no rubber, but I'm not quite sure that there's a difference <laughs> or not. I don't know if you get out of tires and into virgin rubber, if if those things are, and, and maybe they, you know, probably the correct is not no, but at a threshold level. Um, yeah. My understanding of rubber is limited <laughs> in terms of this. I don't know if there's rubber that doesn't have volatile organic compounds or other kinds of things. Uh, um, so that, I just don't know. Perhaps we could say, uh, you know, as as Tim suggested, encourage what well, that we uh, recommend or encourage whatever term you want to use against using crumb rubber and pursue other alternatives and just leave it at that. I'd be comfortable with that. So can I make a motion? <laughs> Just uh, reading reading off the motion we we have written, I think. So um, from the PFAS, you mean? Yes. Yeah, from the <laughs> based on that. Yeah, I I make a motion that the Board of Health, uh, uh, you know, make a statement that it does not support the use of crumb rubber derived from recycled tires in the construction of the new school playground at, at this time. So that's how I'm just reading the last mm -hmm. sentence. I'll second the motion. Any more discussion? I guess we're ready for a vote. And I'm just going to start with Risha because she has to leave. Yep, thank you. Uh, I, I am in agreement. Yay. Okay. Lauren? Yes. Pramila? Yes. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Yes. So the motion passes. All right. So who is it? Kiko that will draft this or how, how is does it work practically? Because I wasn't around for the PFAS uh, um, issue. What, uh, Tim, because we knew this would be complicated, I, Kiko and I, and a little bit of, uh, had put together the words for the motion. And at the beginning, I could read the whole thing in one piece, Tim, Tim wrote the, the the end of it, but read the end of it. Under Massachusetts general law, the Amherst Board of Health has the responsibility for the protection of the public's health and the protection of the environment from damage and pollution, following the precautionary principle of public health that states that a product, an action, or a policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, protective action should be supported before there is complete scientific proof of risk. The board advises the new school building committee to avoid or limit the use of materials that contain heavy metals, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, microplastics, or other compounds known to be harmful to children and the environment in the playground surface. These chemicals are known to be found in recycled tires. Therefore, the Amherst Board of Health does not support the use of crumb rubber derived from recycled tires in the construction of the new playground, new school playground at this time. So, so it's addressed to the school building committee. They're the ones who have to make the decision. Yeah, oh, sure. Okay, that makes sense then. Could I just ask one question about that, which is that um, the artificial turf was very general. It wasn't about a specific place. And the wording about what that you've just read is about the new playground. And I'm just wondering okay. whether you want it to be broader to apply to other playgrounds that might come up in the future, that this you know advice is broader than just this one school site. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that because we said at this time, you know, it, it might. Uh, 
because for I guess other you know further research could emerge that would change things. I don't know. I'm just yeah. I'm just trying I to think we're foresee doing it in this happen. moment at this time with what we know now. I think down the road it might be broader or we can include other things. So I think we can leave it as for a, yeah. okay. not making a precedent about the any playground ever. Um. Yeah, I, I I actually think that a broader statement is better because obviously we're concerned, to me, it seems we're concerned about public health mm -hmm. everywhere. And, and it, it's this particular issue that has brought it before the board, but it seems to me it would make sense to have it be broader. Um, whatever concerns we have about this particular play playground would um you know would be true of other playgrounds so anyway that's what i think okay. <clears throat> i i actually um i i'm thinking the other way because i feel like the the a new school committee is kind of asking us to to help by making a statement help them by making a statement and um so i think it it's okay that it's more specific um to this this time and this actual decision so i kind of am leaning the other way that i think it's okay to say the new playground or be specific to this construction Yeah, I mean, that's what we voted on, I guess, already, because that okay. we Just did read that, that last yeah. sentence when we voted. So um, let's leave that there. I think if it comes up again, it won't go unnoticed. <laughs> um, okay. If there's another uh, installation that, that requires a similar decision. So let's leave it be. <laughs> All right. So I gotta find my agenda. I think the next is report from. Yeah, we don't have any new business. So the next thing is the nope. trenches update. So I'll just keep it really brief because I know it's late. I'm sure everyone's tired, but um, so just, I like to fill everybody in on what's happening with our yeah. respiratory illness update with COVID in the community. So the wastewater surveillance reports that we get, I don't know if you all check them as Board of Health members, we post them on the web, um, but they're our best indication of uh, COVID infection levels in the community. And there was a big spike right after the holidays, which came rapidly down, but it's been plateauing and sort of going up, um, up and down. So it's not down to the levels that it was before the holidays. It's still, it's right now just a little under a million um, gene copy equivalents per liter. Over a million is considered significant. So we're not significant, but it's not, we're not out of the woods. And I, most of us know someone who has COVID right now. So <laughs> it's still going around, um, mild disease. Um, you know, definitely the hospitals, I think, are struggling just in general with, you've probably read in the papers, just so many folks coming through the ED and how difficult it can be to triage and admit folks. Um, but you know, it's not, it's lasting longer this respiratory illness season than last year, but with less severe disease. So that's kind of the update there. Um, we just got a whole new shipment in of 1800 more tests from the state that we got for free. So we're really excited about that. We're getting those out to the community. People are coming by. A lot of folks are interested in testing because COVID is really still having an impact on people's lives. Um, so that's kind of the respiratory illness update. Um, I mentioned before that we're working with Craig Stores on a hepatitis clinic, which is gonna happen in March. So we'll meet again before that clinic happens, but that's a good partnership that we're happy about just to make sure that folks who are at increased risk for hepatitis A, such as unhoused folks or people who are using injection drugs are gonna get vaccinated if they want that. Um, and then the last thing that we're working on, I think I mentioned last time as well, is a mental wellness series um, that's just starting to take shape recognizing increasing rates of suicide among young people and among just mental wellness being an issue for folks in general in our society, wanting to create ways that we can foster better mental wellness in our 
in our community through bringing people together to talk about what's hard and have conversations and think about activities that we can do as a community to improve mental health. So we're still working out the details. I thought we were going to have a session this month, but it turns out we're going to postpone till March. So come March, April, we'll have some sessions on the books and we'll be promoting those through various means. So you'll probably hopefully see those notices out in the community. Um, so that's pretty much my update. Nothing too radical, sort of the same themes. But thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks. It's so, been a long meeting. I bet we're all tired, right? <laughs> so topics, not in, no, no topics, not into, not anticipated by the chair. So I guess we're ready for a motion to adjourn. I can make a motion to adjourn. And I can second. Okay. Um, Lauren? Risha? Yeah. Okay, Risha. Sorry. <laughs> All right, yeah. Lauren? Okay for me too. Okay. Premila. Aye. Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we'll see you again in a month. The next meeting will be on March 14th, 2024, 5 30. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.